Good morning, or afternoon. I just uh, landed from Beijing. Apologies. <laughs> okay. All right. It's a pleasure to have the, the chance to talk about infrastructure in, in arguably the most dynamic uh, infrastructure space on the planet, uh, where more infrastructure will be uh, f spent and hopefully funded uh, over, the, uh, over the coming uh, yeah, their system is not, yeah. Are we good? Either that or volume has to go up. One or, there are two options here. I'm going to continue to mutter randomly. <laughs> not quite yet, huh? All right. Yes, that is correct. Common issue here. Common, common issue. Nope. Bad infrastructure in Singapore. Infrastructure I'm sure. IT. What? <laughs> IT. <laughs> the software. Hey. The hardware. made in Canada, so. <laughs> 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 but I don't think. No, no. Made in China, you could blame me. No, but no, not uh, not the case, guys. Really. <laughs> We'll go ahead then. Um, apparently, okay. The uh, look infrastructure. This is a it, sometimes it's a game for specialists, but it affects all of us. So today we're going to have a chance to talk about this from government perspective, from a finance perspective, uh, and from a uh, and a user's perspective. So with me today are we have the the full panoply of expertise. Uh, starting from my, my right, we have uh, Renee uh, from Ayala Corporation, but formerly also of Manila Water, uh, has a, a great deal of background in PPPs and public finance. Uh, to, to, uh, to his left, to my right, Sadia, leader of the Emerging Asia Fund from IFC, the uh, entrepreneur, I was, can I say the entrepreneurial branch of the World Bank Group? <laughs> So, uh, so with uh, you know with deep expertise in creating innovative and out of the box solutions, uh, on my left, uh, Wen Tsai uh, has been uh, structuring uh, the uh, infrastructure markets in Asia for the Asia Development Bank for the last twenty years. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're four years, but uh, yeah, been, uh, years, years, years behind that in development. In de Exactly, in development expertise. And of course, uh, Ben, Ben Wei, leader uh, from uh, Asia for Macquarie. Uh, uh, welcome, Ben. And you see the light, you know, the, the, the power goes on when, when we speak about, <laughs> when we speak about Ben and, and the overview of, uh, overview of Asia. So uh, I think all of us have seen a lot of numbers, um, and I won't, I mean, so therefore, and I'm from McKinsey, so I must have a few more. Um, our, our global infrastructure report uh, puts out at the roughly a $3.3 trillion spend on infrastructure uh, globally over the next uh, 15 years annual, uh, per annum. Uh, of which 60% in emerging markets, uh, so a non-trivial number by anybody's standards. 
Uh, however, against that, uh, looking at historic patterns, uh, and that's a need-based uh, number, sort of looking at a historic patterns of spend, arguably an 11 to 15 percent gap on that, or three to four hundred billion dollars worth of spending that will not get funded. Uh, so, I mean, there's uh, there's both a question of, you know, will we actually fund this, and then what is getting funded, and how well is that happening, and does it deliver the returns and the expert uh, and uh, and the expectations that we have of infrastructure. Uh, with that, you know, recognizing that, that, that funding gap, of course, we come to the role of the public and the private sectors. We sort of realize globally, of course, most infrastructure is publicly funded, uh, but this gap indicates an opportunity potentially for the private sector to do more. And in any case, for the role of the private sector in assuring the value delivery of infrastructure projects and that they are more efficient, that they can be more effectively uh, designed, and they can deliver better benefits uh, to, to their users. Uh, so that essentially is our topic today, sort of what is the uh, the outlook for the spending and the funding of infrastructure and what uh, what is and can be the role of the private sector in delivering those uh, those projects. So I'm going to start, if we will, at the sharp end of the stick with Ben, who has uh, you know, uh, been uh, looking for uh, private sector returns in the infrastructure space for uh, for years and uh, and finding them, I should note, uh, but at the end of, uh, of of a process. So perhaps you can give us a bit of a view on what you see as the as the as the marketplace today uh, for delivering those types of uh, types of opportunities. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I suppose when we think about the infrastructure market in Asia. Um, it's pretty hard to generalise given the diversity of the region in terms of economic development, in terms of legal regimes, in terms of cultures. So it is hard to generalise, but I do think there are some you know, interesting patterns or rules at play at the moment that help kind of shape the, uh, that kind of shape the region. I think the first one is that if you're in a developed market or in an investment grade market and you have a brownfield asset today, you have a lot of competition <coughs> for that asset if you want to sell it. That is to say, there are large pockets of institutional capital both within Asia but from around the world that are interested in buying assets that you know have steady cash flows and operational track records. And so people who own those assets today have you know assets that are probably more valuable than ever before. And there's an enormous amount of capital chasing that, in particular capital that's looking for quality yield. And we know in terms of the asset management or assets under management movements that increasingly insurance companies, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds are moving capital into the alternates bucket, whether you're an insurer in China or a pension fund in Japan. And your biggest challenge today is to actually define deployment opportunities for that capital. So when we speak to the CIOs, that's what they want. They want brownfield operating infrastructure assets, and they're willing to buy those in developed markets like Korea or Japan, just as they're willing to buy them in developing markets such as the Philippines or India. So if you're in that bucket, you're in a pretty good position. The big, I think, real issue is this big need for the infrastructure build out. And even though we've got the world awash with capital, we're finding it very hard to match all those new product projects, particularly in developing markets, the development and greenfield product uh, projects with capital. And I think that's the fundamental challenge for Asia over the next 20 years. You know, as more people move into cities and we see the largest migration in human history, the thing we're struggling with is how we can get that capital confident to go into those new projects, whether they be in Thailand, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and so on. And, you know, our view is probably three things need to happen. First, we have very inconsistent PPP frameworks at the moment around the region. And it's kind of a little bit odd, I think. We actually have this playbook already written in certain countries and it's worked well, and yet we refuse in a whole range of markets to replicate that playbook. And so if we go back to say what Korea did 20 years ago after the financial crisis, when the government couldn't fund the build out of infrastructure but knew it needed it, it had a very... I suppose, attractive PPP framework that incented institutional capital to come in and it shared a lot of the risk with that capital through minimum revenue guarantees and inflation, uh, inflation mechanisms. Today, Korea doesn't need to offer those sorts of regimes anymore because it's built the confidence in the market for capital to come there. And the issue I think that we're seeing is not enough 
markets around the world are replicating a lot of the lessons we've learned from these markets that adopted these regimes 20 years ago and hence capital is struggling to get there. And I think the second thing that that then creates is the fact that people are still struggling about how to deal with currency and commodity risks in a lot of these emerging markets. And then thirdly, there's also I think some questions around the transparency of the overall processes to award those PPPs. So our view is the markets that actually help solve for those issues the quickest will be the markets that will be able to create investable projects and that will actually mean that you'll see, I think, that gap between the projects and the funding close. And so I think ultimately what that is really about in this region is creating confidence. We know when institutions are confident about a market, they'll invest there. And once you have that momentum, you'll have more capital than actually you need. And I, and I think that's probably you know, the key thing we need to see happen, particularly in those markets where there are a lot of unfunded projects today. Thanks, Ben. So confidence, how to build it, <laughs> the institutional uh, trust and transparency and to manage those risks. Uh, Wen Tsai, how has ADB been building confidence? <laughs> Yes, yeah, thank you, Jensen. I think uh, this is uh, you know it's a very traditional topic, but also you know we need to think about this in more innovation, innovative way about uh, infrastructure financing. I can tell you every day, you know, in ADB we are talking about this how we support the infrastructure project in many of our you know developing member countries. We see on one hand, you know, here's a huge demand, huge infrastructure deficit, you know, in different sectors: energy, transport, urban infrastructure, water, sanitation transport, um, among many other irrigation, so, you know, water resources management. So many s sectors, we see that, huge, you know, deficit here, right? On the other hand, uh, we, we say, okay, you know, we, we, you know, we need to mobilize more, more resources for this, How, where we can get the money, right? Government, certainly public sector, can, you know, uh, try to mobilize more resources from revenue side, you know, uh, from, you know, like a multilateral development like ADB and other World Bank, I've seen, you know, and uh, bilateral agencies, uh, you know, that certainly they can do, but at the same time, you know, most part of the money will come from the private sector. So, so where we can get the money from the private sector? How can we develop the bankable project? A lot of project, I can tell you, uh, in, in the member country, I, I, you know, I were, you know, have in charge of, I, I'm in, in the ADB, I'm in charge of South Asia and the Central and Western Asia. I visit these countries, you know, they talk to me, you know, they want ADB to support more PPP kind of project. Right, they want more private sector money. The message is very clear. They want more PPP project. They want more private sector investment in their infrastructure, you know, uh, area. But uh, how can we address that? And uh, you know, they all know that without uh, the very solid, very you know, good infrastructure, it just cannot right move to the next stage. Many country already in the middle income, but whether they can go to the higher level, upper middle or higher level development status. You know, they don't have, have this kind of so-called middle income trap. How can I avoid that middle income trap in the coming years, right? So, you know, this is something, you know, that's a big challenge for all of us. You know, at the regional, sub-regional level, you know, people talk about this regional integration cooperation, you know, the one belt, one road initiative, high quality infrastructure initiative proposed by Japan, China, you know, BRI, you know, but how can we build that connectivities? Cross-border, road, railway, you know, uh, cross-border power trading from power surplus to power deficit countries, right? And other, many other trade facilitation, you know, cross-border movement, right? The easier movement of good service. How can we do that? You know, these kind of things. So uh, how, how can we address that? But basically, you have to build uh, the, the basic infrastructure in place, the hardware in place. Then you can talk about software, right? Policy dialogue, trade facilitation, trade, you know, liberalization. So I, I just, you know, this is a, the, the, one of the biggest challenges, right? We, you know, ADB, you, I think, the, the, I saw that this meeting also used ADB's estimate, right? $26 trillion for the next 15 years before 2030, including the, the money for the climate financing. And also $1.7 trillion every year. Also, this is also another big, right? You see that. Nobody can do this alone. We ADB, like last year, we deliver, you know, like, uh, you know, 17, more than 17 billion dollars together with some 14 billion co-financing. But still, like, you know, more than 30 billion, 31 billion, right? World Bank maybe all together to, with FC, I don't know how much, eight, 80 million or 70 billion? Yeah, something like that. Still, right? We have a new player like AIB and NDB also, right? Coming to, to this region. So they deliver just the beginning of the operation last year, right? 1.7 billion. 
AIB, 1.5 billion for NDB, if I memory is, is correct. But cost still catch up. They try to increase their lending significantly in the coming years. But you can see that all together, right? Still very limited. $1.7 trillion. So I, you know, we have to ask, you know, just ask me how we can do that. I think for the ADB side, we cannot do this alone. We have to work with other, with government, private sector, other, you know, international financial institutions. What we can do, I tell you, you know, in ADB, right? We try to do among, the, you know, the, the following, you know, major things. We want, you know, uh, do uh, try to improve. Uh, my colleague mentioned about this lack of a regulatory institutional framework, right, for for the private sector. We we try, you know, they don't have many countries don't have a very good uh, business environment for the private sector. So how can we do that? We use our money, use our loan, use our TA, technical system to, to help them to formulate, like, you know, to formulate a PPP act, PPP law, set up a PPP unit, unit PPP you know, office uh, in many countries. We try to provide the capacity building, right? How to help them to structure the, 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 you know, the, the deal, PPP deal. We provide the transaction, what do we call transaction advisor services. You know, so ADB, pro so we can help them to structure the deal in many countries, right? In a different sector, like airport, power plant, port, or maybe in a water supply uh, <coughs> project, among many others. So this is called the transaction advisor services, right? So we also try to, you know, that to, to uh, mobilize, you know, uh, try to develop more innovative instruments. Uh, you know, traditionally we provide debt financing, right? Loan project loan, right? For for the, we also now, you know, uh, try to. Uh, develop more innovative kind, like like a guarantee, more use of a guarantee, like you know also the credit enhancement product, uh, like uh, you know we pro we pro even provide guarantee to the project SPV to issue the bond. I think India, in other in, in Philippines, and in other countries, I think I've seen also have done this. So we provide guarantee so that the, the, the SPV they can issue the, the the local currency bond, you know with a with a better right because it, we we enhance their rating, so that kind of things. So, you know, and also we use the uh, risk transfer instrument. Like uh, we involve this uh, insurance company, reinsurance, right, to join us, you know, to try to, you know, to manage the risk, right? So I think, you know, all those kind of innovative kind of thinking, you know, and also we, we issue a lot of local currency bond in Asia, you know, like uh, in Philippines, I think in uh, Indonesia, in Thailand, you know, Georgia, you know, uh, India, China. I think Kazakhstan, and in the coming years, we are going to do more. This kind of local currency, national Asian currency denominated bonds. So, you know, this is, this is really like long-term financing, right? You know, you issue the bond. So, uh, you know, and, and also we, we also, of course, try to issue more bonds from the ADB, like including the, 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 you know, the green bond also, you know, these days. So I just let you know, colleagues, we, so we have to think about a more innovative kind of uh, instrument, right? So, so we can engage more private sector to join us. So they will feel more comfortable about, about the risk, about the return, right? About, uh, you know, the, so I can tell you, in many countries, we push very hard for many <laughs> government to do the reform. Like, uh, you know, energy sector, transport, urban water sector, we push very much for like a, a tariff, you know, water, you know, water tariff, electricity tariff. So we have that kind of dialogue, you know, like uh, the international financial institution, right? We have the country policy dialogue with the government. So with that, you know, if you have a, you know, more reasonable kind of water tariff or electric tariff, right? You, you guys can come, the private sector, join us. You put your money there for the water supply and the electricity, right, later. So you, you can also, you know, have a very reasonable uh, financial return. So I think, uh, you know, many things, but these days also, we are trying to also build, uh, you know, the kind of uh, digital kind of platform for the, for, the, for the private sector, you know, infrastructure project preparation, together with other uh, MDB and also, you know, you, so you can know the project, you know, uh, uh, you know through this, this flat platform, you know, about the right, public and private sector kind of project. So you can come. And also we are trying to strengthen monitoring of member countries, you know, PPP, business environment, now these days. I think we, we already got eight countries to join us, you know, at the first stage. You'll see more countries will join us. We'll, 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 we'll even publish those monitoring results. You'll see that, how when you do the, you know, the, like a PPP in Pakistan or Bangladesh, right? In the future, you'll see, that, you know, those kind of, uh, you know, what, what's the policy environment over here? So I just let you know, we try to address, you know, private sector concern. Try to, you know, to push more reform, right, fundamentally you know, regulatory institutional, you know, even, you know, regulatory reforms, right? So that uh, you will have a more maybe viable, 
you know, kind of, you know, dynamic kind of project here. So more project could be really like bankable, right? You know where you can get a project. You know how you think maybe we can help you to structure a good project. So you can put your money with us, with the government together. So I just feel that many things we can do. So uh, of course I said again, you know, we cannot do this alone. We have to join to the work together. So maybe I should stop here for the first round. Maybe I, would, I, I cannot speak too much. Maybe thank you very much. Yeah. Well, I think that I, I think that's great. Actually, when saying it gives us a lot to uh, to to look forward to. <laughs> I think what you were you know, sort of describing the the innovations that you're putting in place and the risk that you're starting to mitigate and the expectation that we will see a very different financing environment uh, in let's say 24 months. Right. Yeah. So, so, so that, that gives us a time frame now. But uh, Sadia, from where you sit today, how does it look? <laughs> uh, thank you. So I, I think as some of you might be aware about uh, two years ago, most of the 200 governments in the world signed up to uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, very ambitious agenda. I think there are 26 SDGs, but several of them relate to what we're talking about today. So to give every human being on the planet access to electricity, water, um, our transportation, the basics of connectivity. And as part of that uh, uh, initiative, uh, the governments realized, no big surprise, that for every dollar of official development assistance, they're going to have to mobilize another $7 from somewhere else in order to meet these, these very ambitious goals. So I think official ODA is, what, a few hundred billion a year? So we're talking about mobilizing trillions of dollars. And I, I think you mentioned earlier for for Asia, we need something like 1.7 billion every year. Uh, at the moment, we spend trillion, about trillion, trillion, trillion. trillion. Yeah, and we trillion. and we spend about 800 billion yeah. now, right? So the gap is a, is another 800. Um, so the IFC is being do, been doing a little bit uh, in that space, a couple of uh, different things. Uh, one is on the debt side. Uh, we have uh, we started working with the uh, uh, with the central bank in China. They gave us three billion dollars to basically deploy into infrastructure projects anywhere in the world that we thought were bankable. Uh, we've used all of that up, and we're now moving from that to, to doing a similar sort of structure with the private sector. Uh, we're working with two insurance companies that have signed up. Uh, we're working with uh, a couple of uh, sovereign wealth funds. Um, but again, that's what, a few billion. Uh, on the equity side, uh, I work for something called the IFC Asset Management Company, which mobilizes third-party funds to invest across different sectors, including infrastructure. I run an Asian fund, which is uh, some $700 million. Uh, we, yeah, we expect to deploy across sectors, but infrastructure will be perhaps 30% of that. So as I look around, uh, around the region and I think, okay, you know, where should I invest the infrastructure piece of, of my pot? Um, most people would say probably you know, China, India, uh, Indonesia, some of the bigger economies. Uh, and yet the first deal we've done is not in, in those bigger spaces, but uh, in, in Bangladesh. And why is that? What is it about Bangladesh that makes it attractive to, to private sector investors? And I think it's not rocket science, it's that Bangladesh for the last uh, 20, 30 years has provided what investors want, which is predictability, uh, regulatory framework that, uh, that has been proven, uh, very strong uh, agreements in the power sector, well, which, is, which is where we've invested, uh, so, and a tariff which is sufficient to cover debt service and to give investors uh, an adequate return. So one of the questions I asked my panelists earlier, uh, my fellow panelists earlier, was, you know, what's an adequate return in infrastructure? And of course, the answer is, it depends. But in a market like Bangladesh, and I would say similar countries like, let's say, Myanmar, Pakistan, something like 17% seven, IRR in dollars is, is what people are looking for and what makes it really attractive. Now, if we turn, turn to the Philippines, it will be a very different number. But many, many, many years ago, actually, the Philippines pioneered the <coughs> whole framework in terms of uh, dollar-linked PPAs um, and covering your costs and having a predictable environment. So um, long story short, I mean, I think it's not rocket science. I mean, governments that really want to make a difference need to think about what they have to do in order to facilitate private sector investment and to sign up and to stick to what they sign up for. And are you... Uh I'm just curious then, so as you look across the region, uh, how would you rate governments? I mean, in the sense of if uh, an A grade is a government that has a very consistent regulatory policy across all asset classes where you can see that type of transparency and consistent and, and the alternative. So, so uh, unfortunately, I mean, I, uh, it's not across all asset classes, all sectors. For, for better or for worse, power is the sector where, uh, where most people focus, and that's probably half of the gap that we're talking about. So uh, 
uh, Pakistan, Philippines, Thailand, uh, Bangladesh, these are predictable uh, frameworks where you know what you're getting. Uh, the returns might be different, uh, but Indonesia and India are much less predictable. Indonesia has a PPA framework, but sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. People pay ridiculous prices. So I've been a little bit surprised because I would have thought China and India would be my big markets, but actually I think Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, will, will, Myanmar will be the places we end up investing. Sadia, can I just ask a question though? Um, I don't know, I, 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 I hear what you're saying, but if I, when I go to see CIOs of insurance companies and sovereign wealth funds, I have to say I don't think any of them that I know globally um, would say I'm keen to put my money in Bangladesh or Pakistan. Right, which is not to say those aren't good investment destinations and it's not to say that they can't get the right return. And IFC has often been at the forefront of, I suppose, being a pioneer in these markets. And so I think the broader industry is always thankful for that. But you know, given your experience there, which I think is very different to probably um, a lot of institutions' perceptions of those markets, how do you think we can address that issue to get people more comfortable and to, I suppose, get them the level of insight that perhaps you've got for, for markets which they would probably consider outside um, their asset allocation today? Um, so I think uh, the, the two instruments I mentioned earlier, so what we call the, uh, the Master Cooperation Co-Lending Program, where we first worked with SAFE in China, and now we're working with Allianz and Prudential and a number of other uh, um, institutional investors. They basically go along with whatever we're doing in the, on the debt side, so, uh, and, and we have a first loss provision there. So they know we understand the market, we understand the government, we understand the regulator, we understand the off-taker in the case of power or the tariff agreement for toll roads or whatever, uh, and they're willing to, to trust us on that. Um, equally on the fund side, I mean, we have uh, the asset management company ma manages about $10 billion of, of assets. Uh, my particular fund has a sovereign wealth fund, it's got a development bank, it's got three commercial banks, we have a na national pension fund. None of them know any of these markets. What they're betting, rightly or wrongly, I, I hope rightly, is that because we've been there for, for 60 years, because we have you know 700 people in Asia and 26 offices across the region, that we know what we're doing. Um, so I really think you need institutions like the Asian Development Bank, the Asian Infrastructure Bank, the IFC, to, to intermediate un until people get, get comfortable. All right, well, with that, let me just turn to you, Renee, and sort of like you have seen this from the Philippines side of it over multiple decades. How is it playing out? About a year ago, when Sai and I were in Tokyo, and we were talking about 1.5 trillion, and a few months later, it became 1.7 trillion. Now it scares me what it will be a few months from now. And at that conference in Tokyo, uh, I did meet the CEO of the New Development Bank, and <clears throat> there was a, as Ben said, there's money, there's project, something has to happen in between. And because of that, uh, our own company, the way I run the infrastructure group of Ayala, I've had to tweak the structures to address the present realities. So we have had very good experience. Um, IFC started us off with Manila Water, very good investment, very good returns, touted to be, have been one of the best uh, PPPs we have, we've ever done. We met some challenges. We're still alive. We're still producing. We're still uh, contributing. But most of all, we're getting drinking water to people. Um, ben, uh, Macquarie, and us are together in a project, uh, transport. We're in light trail. Uh, it is moving. It's doing well. The happiest group of commuters in Metro Manila today are courtesy of uh, Macquarie's investment in Ayala's investment into light rail. Um, <clears throat> just to set an example of how good it is, from 45 minutes waiting time for a, for a traveler, we're now down to eight minutes. Uh, headway between trains from six minutes is down to three minutes, and by the end of the year, we're gonna bring it down to about two minutes because we're reducing the headway significantly by improving the speed of the train from from the maximum 40 kilometers to now minimum of 60 kilometers an hour. I guess what I'm saying is, first of all, infrastructure is not just about priming the economy, it's also about addressing structural challenges. Poverty, as a matter of fact, can be directly alleviated by better infrastructure. So there's no question to the fact that it's needed. There is a need, there is money. Some, and that's why the middle portion is where we found ourselves in. What we've done is we've um, 
I've been told to be a bit more pragmatic on the playing the long game. If you're a publicly listed company and your analysts are going to ask you for your P&L every year, you'd be really scared going into an infrastructure project on a 30-year concession and lose money in the first 10 years. It's going to be a significant P&L drag, not to mention the resources, credit limits, and all that. So admittedly, private, a private company cannot do it alone. Not a private infrastructure company needs both <coughs> government, multilaterals, funds, investors, all together. But it can work. So what we've done is we've divided the initiatives that we do now into three buckets, the project inception phase, the project development phase up to approval, and the project execution to sustainability phase. How did this happen? Mainly because when I was in Tokyo with Wensai um, meeting some of the <clears throat> new entries into the infrastructure market, we were quite surprised that uh, a lot of insurance guys, pension funds, have started saying, no, we want to come in earlier. We don't want to wait until the project is completed and margins are lowered, somebody takes a shave on the spread. So as a matter of fact, there's a lady from Singapore who's very aggressively been going to Manila saying, a pension fund wants to start as soon as we get government approval. They want to be in already. Macquarie did that with us in the light rail. Um, the advantage there is you get full benefits of the returns as they come in. So in the, in the Philippines, the unsolicited format was given. So I now have a team of people just going around looking for what we call hot spots and pain spots. And in, a, in a my situation, I spend a minimum of four hours a day in the car and sometimes five hours a day during traffic. So there is a real incentive of people willing to pay to be on a toll road, willing to dish out a little bit more, um, willingness to pay toll just to be able to move faster or giving them alternatives. I think that is the reality we have in, in the mega cities, um, whether it's Indonesia and not as much as Malaysia and Thailand anymore, but in Indonesia and the Philippines, it's a real challenge. So there's very little market risk, but we're looking for pain points because we believe that's where we start projects. Then we start developing a project. Then you have a new set of guys who are saying, I like the idea, let me join you on this. All the way until approval. Upon approval, another set of investors come in and say, now that you've got a concession framework, now that you've got a project in place, we want to join you. And this is a big change, whereas before it was mainly build a toll road, get it running, as soon as it's profitable, then we're interested to buy, which is what exactly we now have is we have a toll road. We funded it ourselves. We put it together. It's now working. It's the, the daily traffic is more than our estimates. The returns are better than what we anticipated it to be. And so I've got five people offering to buy the toll road from us. <clears throat> We've got two pension funds saying, why don't I buy a portion of it because I want the, 33, the remaining 30-year 30 uh, cash flow that's going to come in. Uh, we're, going, we're trying to optimize, and we will, we will do it at the right time. What am I saying? I'm just saying that the challenge of that middle portion of how to make projects happen, how to, how to bring the finance thing into the project so that we can execute it, is a, it requires continuous innovation, and it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's almost in every country, it's a different thing. In that Tokyo conference, I was being invited to go to Myanmar. I don't know if when I remembered. After I talked to a few people, they said, "Why don't you do? Why don't you do this in Myanmar?" I said, "I, I can't. I don't know how. I do not know what the regulatory framework in Myanmar is. I do not know how it's going to be, and I have enough. Ex I have enough challenges and excitement dealing with the regulatory environment in the Philippines today, <laughs> and um, to 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 venture out uh, beyond. So." I, ideally, what happens is, I think um, 1.7 trillion, 800, it's all going to come together. The demand is there. We have a toll road project wherein um, we're saying we'll be 60% utilized on the day we, we open. And our original financial assumptions was only 40% utilization. So IFC will now look at us and say, yeah, now we're interested because <laughs> now... Now the returns are going to be better than, than, what, uh, than the 15% hurdle or something to that effect. But the reality is the demand is so strong. I think the, big, the biggest selling point I have to government is if you had a fiscal space, you had money, 
let the private sector do by a PPP the projects, the infrastructure projects that are already going, there's no market risk literally. Now, there are projects that are economically viable but not financially viable and that's probably where government should continue to use their finances, oh dear, whatever. But in the areas where the project has a very significant economic impact and definitely vi financially viable, then private sector should be invited to come in, not just to finance the project, because that was in answer to the question of Ben, how do you get investors to feel safer about going to a project? I guess we need to build institutions that are acceptable <coughs> to the private investors as being able to execute and reasonable in their assumptions and in the structures that they put together. Okay, but uh, I think that's a great example, but of what I think Ben was saying, we would call a brownfield asset. You, cre you created something, it operates, it's, getting, it's, it's, it's meeting this need, all of a sudden the world's interested. <laughs> um, exactly. As opposed to kind of where you st we started this conversation saying, well, what about the greenfield? What about the, the new urbanization, the hundreds of millions of people who actually are gonna show up and there's nothing there? Um, so can we see a role for the private sector in the greenfield asset, in the, in the environment where there isn't a strong regulatory framework and an, a tariff agreement and, 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 uh, that, that is already tested and proven. I mean, I'm just opening that to see whether... Yeah. Uh, I mean, I that. think we're already seeing that, but again, it depends on what market you're talking about. So, you know, if you look at, say, India and China today, let's take the two biggest markets by population, there is an enormous amount of private capital often coming from financial institutions, going into the greenfield development of wind, of solar, of uh, waste to energy, of toll roads, not so much in China anymore, but still a lot of capital going into toll roads and uh, other transport assets in India. So I think they're two markets which have created enough proof of concept that people understand the regulatory framework, they understand the FIT schemes, they understand how the concessions work and their flexibilities to come in and out of those uh, concession arrangements where actually there's a lot of capital and the good thing is there's actually a lot of permits being issued, there's a lot of scale. And so we're now seeing you know, a wind turbine built in China every hour. You know, Five out of the six world's biggest solar farms are either in India or China. So in some ways there's good examples and there's reasons for us to be optimistic in those markets. I think the bigger issue comes down to, you know, I think the point Renee was making and also Sadia is that we have a supply issue in the sense that we have more than enough demand for capital for projects, particularly for Greenfield. But at the moment, if we're only deploying 800 billion out of 1.7 trillion, we've got a massive supply issue. And that, that equation can't be fixed by ADB or IFC alone or the AIB or the NDB, they're doing a great job and in, in many ways a heroic job but the fact of the matter is we're only 50% of the funding that we really require. And it's not so much I think the markets like India and China that are a concern where they're big, they're well known, they've got you know pretty good sovereign risk indicators particularly over the last couple of years and in the case of China you've actually got a lot of domestic capital in the listed space and also in the SOE space that actually can help fund those build outs. It's not those countries, I think it's the countries more where you know there's only 20% electrification where there is no proper water infrastructure, those countries where we need infrastructure, not just from an economic development point of view, but from a human, you know, sort of standards living perspective, that's what I think we're going to, that's, that's where I think the real challenge is for Asia today. Sadi, would you agree, is there a role for the private sector that we can find that role in greenfield assets as well? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the Bangladesh company I was talking about has a 1,400 megawatts of existing assets, which is painfully built up over 30 years, but they are now very ambitious and they want to double and triple that. So we, IFC, along with two other investors, uh, two other firms have invested um, some 100, uh, some $75 million. And we are now putting the assets into a Singapore holding company and we will be listing them on the Singapore Stock Exchange, planning to raise $300 million next year in an IPO. Uh, and they will use that to, to then build more greenfield projects in Bangladesh and to double the capacity in two or three years. So absolutely, if you have the right environment, there's a big role for the private sector in greenfield. Okay, 
the, uh, your, and that is predicated on the quality of that fund today, the, the assets, the existing assets, and the management, the, the regulatory framework that they have put in place for the growth of those assets? Yes, but I think it helps that, you know, you've got uh, IFC and these two other investors are kind of putting the stamp of approval and saying, yes, this makes sense. Because otherwise, most investors in the Singapore Stock Exchange don't know anything at all about Bangladesh. So they, they need other people to, to, you know, to kind of interpret for them. Just uh, last one question, we're going to go to the audience. Um, that, uh, and I think there are people in the audience who know a lot more about Myanmar, incidentally. So there <laughs> might be one or two questions about that. But uh, uh, one, one perhaps less charitable interpretation of the reason for the eight gap between the 800 and the 1.7 is that these are simply unbankable uh, projects. Now, these are just not good projects. Uh, and they, they should be better. <laughs> um, and is there a role for the private sector to fix the projects, to rethink the pipeline? And I, I think you mentioned one side this idea of uh, the PPP delivery unit. How much of that is going to be just about, uh, you know, uh, more efficient market making, and how much of it is about actually about changing the project pipeline? Yeah, I think you know. I said, uh, of course, you know, many countries are you know trying to improve the. Uh, you know, that uh, PPP policy environment, you know, uh, regulatory framework. I think different countries may have at a different stage of the, this, uh, you know, development. Some countries may be at an advanced stage, some may be, you know, not that good. But uh, I can see this is a general trend that, you know, coming years. So I think at least like, uh, you know, uh, my colleague Ben mentioned that, uh, uh, leads, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, for some sector, some project, I do see that, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I see these days like a hydropower sector or even, you know, very often the private sector are very keen for the, for the PPP project. They want to put their money there, even equity investment, not just loan, commercial banks also are very keen on that. And also some like uh, even the road with, with like a tall road also, right? Like. Uh, you know, BOT, BOT, you know, that kind of uh, project also, right? And the uh, water sector also, if uh, the water tariff is really good, yeah, I think uh, I can see that the private sector also want, particularly for the big cities, you know, I think of Manila, water, and other big city, I can see that even like, you know, in, like Dhaka, maybe in the coming years, or Colombo, you know, I can see that even other big cities, uh, you know, uh, in, you know, in, Ch in China, India, uh, there's great potential for, for private sector, right? So uh, I think uh, even the renewable energy these days, you know, solar, rooftop, you know, we support uh, India with, you know, big investment for roof, rooftop solar, you know. I, I, we started with the public sector window. Later, I think, uh, you know, private sector will join. So this kind of thing, so I, I just tell you, so still, right, uh, we, we see the, the, the potentials as we try to improve the policy environment here. At least we start with some sectors, but later other sectors may, may come up, you know, uh, we, you know, later. So I do feel that, uh, well, of course we need some time, but uh, I think uh, in general, I feel uh, we are moving in that uh, right direction. You know, you'll see more kind of PPP project in, in this region. And uh, I, I think uh, maybe, you know, uh, my colleague mentioned about right now some project may be economically, you know, viable, but financially may not be viable still, right? So even the government will try to provide budget money to, to support this, uh, you know, O&M, what we call operation and maintenance, right? Because they don't have uh, the money after the completion of a project. They, so budget has to, has been, you know, budget money has been there to cover the O&M. Or sometimes in a road, you know, in a road project in India, we also try to get to the private sector to be there. We we use the so-called uh, you know performance-based maintenance contract. You 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 got a contract to build a road. After you know completion, you know you know after maybe three years, five years, six years, you will be the one also to handle the, the maintenance. You see, we're trying to you know also involve the private sector, right, to to to, to handle this operation and maintenance. So I think a lot of you know, new innovative kind of thinking we are, we are trying to do. So uh, I, I see that we already did, you know, done some several projects in India you know, for, the, for the road sector in, in a state, in a province. So I think, uh, you know, we, to address your question, you know, it's maybe at least in some sectors, some projects, some countries, I see that, right? So we still can see the roles, you know, private sector can, can join us for, for this. But I think in, in, the, in the coming five years, I think we, if we can quickly improve this regulatory legal framework in many of our DMCs. I think uh, I'm still very confident that you'll see more and more projects uh, coming, you know, to, I mean, joined by the private sector. I can tell you, we have a lot of projects, you know, in our pipeline, but sometimes we are also looking for the, the co-financiers. You know, not only from official co-financiers, but also commercial co-financiers. In the Pakistan, in, you know, in the, in the Bangladesh, or in India, we support the state-owned. 
the infrastructure finance company. You know, in India, you know that the state owned big in infrastructure finance company. Bangladesh also. And uh, you know, Pakistan was already talked to me about also set up some like state owned infrastructure financing mechanism in the coming days. So maybe we can support this state owned kind of you know, financial institution or banks. And then you maybe private sector can join some of the project here. And later, right, you, maybe you can do the project yourself. I mean, you know, there must be some way of, of moving from the current situation to the next. So a public sector or public, you know, uh, you know state-owned kind of financial institution, right, may pl can play a role. But later, I think a private bank, private financing company will, will, will catch up. So I, I just feel that, uh, you know, we, we must have a strategy, a roadmap for doing more PPP in Asia and Pacific. We, we all know that. There is a need here. And the private sector also have, is very keen. But how can we address your, your comfort, your, your, your concern about the risk? Uh, you want to get some, some reasonable return. So this is something, you know, the gap, how we can, can, can you know, to, 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 to get to the, the, the gap, right, to a field. So, uh, you know, something we have to do together. So I, I feel, uh, you know, I, I, a lot of work we can do together, yeah. So I, I just want to say the credit enhancement vehicle that you guys put together on the construction risk side, I think that is actually a really good example yeah. of uh, how you can take a, you know, a piece of risk, disaggregate it, and mitigate it, and that yeah, actually can right. make a project work. Uh, I won't put you in the delicate political situation of asking which country do you think is doing the best right now and <laughs> being more innovative, but if you, maybe afterwards you can let me know. Uh, <laughs> okay. All right, I think we have time for a couple of questions from the audience, and I'm optimistic that we have a microphone. Um, so, uh, right there. Terrific. Maybe I should start because it's the Philippines as an example. Yeah. The other ASEAN countries are learning. You talked about the energy sector. The price of um, the grid price now is so low. There's an oversupply, but nobody's going to lose their, nobody's going to close up. Uh, spot market's really low, but look at what Vietnam did. Vietnam just <laughs> offered a fit rate, uh, time bound fit rate, <coughs> to attempt to accelerate, uh, to accelerate uh, renewable energy. But regardless of what the fit rate is, if you looked at the grid price that the state distribution company Vietnam is now buying from, and you know how much it costs to generate using solar, there clearly there's an opportunity. So there's now a rush to Vietnam by everybody who wants to invest into it and say, you know, here, here's a good situation. So in answer to your question, yes, uh, I guess those of us who started earlier are, are going through our own difficulties right now. Um, countries are learning. I, I know for a fact that uh, some have been looking at our transportation issues. Uh, scalability, yes, it's political. Um, to, uh, tariff increase becomes a political discussion. We've had our experiences. Indonesia has had its challenges in the past, the water sector as well. Uh, it, these are real, but then the idea is to find solutions to it. So, which is where the, the government action, courtesy of, of guys like Wen Sai, who's going to fund them and tell them this is the way it should be, uh, makes sense. Now, there's also this thing about, I guess, there are those of us who are 
I don't know how to say this politically correct, uh, more battle scarred than others in dealing with a regulatory environment and having survived it and continue to make a business uh, despite some of these uh, these shifts. That that's a uh, there's a different tolerance there's a different tolerance level among different sets of investors and funders on that. <clears throat> Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, based on my knowledge, you know, you know re like particularly for South Asia and Central West Asia, some country even told me, uh, Mr. Zhang, I, you know, I'm worried about my own, you know, debt level, particularly the public debt. So they said, I want to have more private sector money for my, you know, development project. So I, maybe I want to have more kind of, you, you are more, sub even ask the ADB to provide the lending for the state own <coughs> or even, you know, the non sovereign loan. They don't even for as we some country told me, you know they, they will not provide the you know the sovereign guarantee. They said I can only provide corporate guarantee. So uh, you please do more non-sovereign loan, or maybe uh, even just a lending with you know with corporate guarantee. So this is maybe kind of uh, maybe one incentive right from some countries. They want to have more private sector money. They, you know, cost the on some country they still want to increase their public sector expenditure for the infrastructure you know they are very still very low much lower than the five percent and normal right we want to say i mean the infrastructure with old gdp right so but some countries they they want to you know because they they want had really want to have a more growth driven by the private sector so you know so that's they also worry about the external debt you know public debt so i, I can see that you know you know coming years you know uh, countries are really I can tell you, you know, the many countries, you know, I visit, right? They, they certainly, they, you know, they told me I, I want to do more private sector investment. So please help us. You know, so I, I think, you know, we should have that confidence. They, 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 I can see the political kind of commitment there. But, but it depends on each country's case. So I'm not saying every country, you know, has, has the same kind of commitment. But in general, I can tell you that's kind of, you know, the feeling, you know, kind of thing, you know, I, I got. I think they have to do, I think governments, at the moment we know that governments or you know, multilateral institutions are funding more than 90% of the new infrastructure build in Asia. That's obviously not sustainable. It's not sustainable for the region, it's not sustainable for governments. So those governments who are looking to shift more of that, if you like, that spend and that responsibility to the private sector, I think have to do three things. The first one is they have to be realistic about what projects make sense to put into a PPP framework. So let's use one example. There is no project IRR in high-speed rail. I love high-speed rail, I love catching high-speed rail, but there has never been a return in Asia as far as I can turn that anyone's ever made. And if you go to the big banks, they'll tell you that most of them have torched quite a bit, money, bit of money on high-speed rail. Now, is high-speed <coughs> rail great for an economy? It is. It gets passengers off the <coughs> freight rail. It stimulates property development and other things around the stations. It moves people more efficient, efficiently and gives you know, consumers more choices, particularly at a lower price versus air travel. So we all like high-speed rail, but there is no project returns. So if a government wants to have high-speed rail, it's something they have to fund themselves. It's almost like social infrastructure. So I think what we need to do is be very realistic. If we're going to shift... Um, you know, projects into the private sector. We need to choose projects that make sense to be funded by the private sector. That's the first thing. The second thing, I think, for a lot of um, the markets around the world, or at least around this region, who are embarking on this journey, is that they need to be realistic about what risk they have to take in the first instance. And think about it almost in waves. So if you haven't had a lot of success as a market in attracting private investment, you probably need to share more of the risk than you would in another market in the first sort of one to five years. As that market builds a reputation of having investable projects, you can pull back the amount of risk, I think, that you, you're sharing with the private sector. And we've seen lots of examples of this. We've seen India do it in roads. We've seen it, you know, Korea do it in all manner of different sectors. And, you know, we sort of touched on that before. And then I think the third thing that governments can do is be a little bit more creative about the way they package up opportunities. Most institutional investors would prefer to write a big check versus a small check. It's just more efficient. Um, it's often seen as being lower risk. And so packaging up 
bigger opportunities. So it's not just a single road or a single you know, water utility. Packaging it up, I think, makes more sense. And the one thing that I think is really interesting about packaging things up, and we're starting to see it in a few markets, is often the government can sell down an existing infrastructure asset, so an operating asset, along with the ability to expand capacity. So it de-risks the, um, if you like, it de-risks the issue for, it de-risks the investment for the institutional investor, but it also allows the government to <coughs> recycle capital efficiently and put that capital into other areas. Now, in that example, you have to have assets to sell. So for some marketplaces, that's a bit of a difficult thing to do. But if you look at, say, how the National Highways Authority is looking at selling down its road portfolio at the moment, that's exactly what it's doing. It's bundling up a number of roads along with expansion opportunities, and that makes it a much more attractive, I think, you know, approach. I think we have time for one more question, one or two more questions right in the front. Yeah. Uh, two things. Uh, the latest number I heard two days ago at the Euro Money Conference was a need for $111 billion mm. of infrastructure investment in Myanmar. And contrary to the bad press uh, recently, two countries both have bad press but have a lot of in, uh, infrastructure development needs and investment going in. Private sector has been operating on a BOT Conspicuous by their absence are a lot of regional multilateral agencies in a country which has one of the lowest per capita uh, debts as well as uh, debt as a percentage of GDP. So when we, I, I was quite surprised by your comments when you're looking at ROI and talking about playing the long game it's a bit of an oxymoron, isn't it? Because if you're playing the long game, you have to start from a point which is not your ideal point. Because over the long period, <coughs> you compensate for that. I think that's something that needs to be addressed. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, this is like <laughs> the long game, right, we play. So I think from the from both sides, you know, government side and the private sector side, you know, you have to be patient with, uh, you know, you have to be reasonable in, in, you know, looking at your return, right? So it's not like, a, you know, a sector you can make a lot of money for, right? But, but still, you know, I think, uh, so I think uh, we, we should have a sense of urgency, even this long game. But given the, the, the challenge we face in the region, in Myanmar also, including, right, many other developing countries, they, they want to build up their infrastructure quickly, well, no, it will take time. It's not easy, right, to, to get all the done in a short period of time. But uh, certainly we should start from now on, right, to help them. I think particularly for the, like, uh, MDB, you know, International uh, Development Bank, right, we should uh, try to help them and, you know, to provide them seed money, right, to their, uh, for the capacity building, for the initial investment, you know, so help them improve the policy environment, you know. So that working with the private sector for some of the project as as a pilot. So I think you know this is a long 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 game. I think we we all should be patient. I agree with you, but but also at the same time you know we we should also work around very you know closely try to help them and to catch up. And uh, you know I I can you know see that this is so important for the region, right? Uh, you know I mentioned at the national level. A lot of requests, and then the sub-regional level also, right? We are talking about these uh, connectivities, physical connectivity in a region. So uh, a lot of uh, economic corridor there, you know, that we needed to build up, you know, for, I uh, just let you know. So uh, it's a long game, but also we have to, to, to think about how we address these, uh, you know, these challenges. I think uh, Ben already made the point that, you know, some projects maybe should not be in the private domain. <laughs> they are, these are actually, but I don't know. So you, have, you've, you kind of play in the intersection here. <laughs> Yes, so I mean, you, that's a good point because multilaterals like the IFC and, and the Asian Development Bank bilaterals should not be there for the long term. They should be there to facilitate the entry of the private sector and once you see the countries 
is bankable and reliable, we should then redeploy our capital in other places. Um, but to the earlier point about some projects just not being fit for the private sector, we all heard this morning about the high-speed train from Mumbai to Ahmedabad. So that's never going to be a private sector project, right? But is it going to be good for India? Yes, it'll be tremendous for India. That, that's where the government should be putting their money. That's also, maybe if I may, you know, that uh, you know, the member countries, you know, create this new bank. You know, uh, mostly right now they, they provide a sovereign law. It's not a non-sovereign law, right? So still, because I think, you know, you know next, I can see the next 10, 15 or uh, years, still there's a big role for the, for the public sector, I should say. You know, but particularly in some of the low-income countries or a country we face some fragile, you know, conflicting situation. So, you know, uh, particularly for those countries in the landlord countries, you know, low income, uh, you know, uh, some policy challenging there. So you cannot expect private sector to be there in, in a short period of time. So it really depends, but I, I, I agree with you. So we still have to, you know, play a role here. We cannot say, oh, we leave it to private sector to handle. We, you know, government, you know, public sector, uh, MDB, we have no role there anymore. No, particularly before 2030. I always said, that, you know, we have a bigger role there. So we have a sense of urgency to work, you know, even harder to support this, you know, the, the project, you know, uh, in the region. All right, I think we are at time. I want to thank the panel very much. I won't really attempt to summarize other than to say I think that we have uh, clarified the spectrum here from private to public and sort of in where the, I think we, as we go and look for our projects, I encourage you all to really think carefully about what's the appropriate source and to really make it a good project. I mean, that uh, these, uh, these projects need to earn, earn returns both economically and socially. So I want to thank the panel very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.